So this is the first mention of Timothy in the Bible. Paul was on his second missionary journey, and it took him through the cities of Derby and Lystra. And these cities are in the middle of Asia Minor, which we know today as modern Turkey. And they were also part of an area known as Galatia, to which Paul would later write a letter uh, known to us today, of course, as the epistle to the Galatians. Now, not every stop Paul made in his journeys are we told the names of the people that he met. But here, we meet one. His name's Timothy. And he is was already a disciple, a follower of Christ, likely the result of Paul's earlier missionary journey. And as I noted, Timothy was probably only about 15 years old. But he wasn't just any disciple. Timothy, it tells us in verse 2, was well spoken of by the brethren. We sometimes get the idea that one has to reach a certain age before a person can have a positive impact on the culture around them for Christ. Not true. Not true. Timothy was the equivalent of a ninth grader, maybe a tenth grader, and, and everyone already knew about his faith. Everyone knew of his integrity. The Christian people in that community knew that they were witnessing the blossoming of a leader that would have a great impact on the world around him. Now realize that while all of this was true, this was a young man who still had all the same sensitivities as everyone else. He wasn't the healthiest person on the planet. He had to deal with sickness from time to time. Look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 23. Paul writes and says to Timothy, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Now, we will give this verse the care and understanding it needs when we get there in this study. So for now, don't focus on the wine. Focus on the fact that Timothy had to deal with frequent infirmities. And yet he soldiered on. He became a pastor in a difficult ministry, and he had, uh, and, he, and at the same time, he had these stomach issues. All right, not an easy thing to deal with, if you ask me. But he did not use illness as an excuse to ignore the call of the Lord upon his life. He was, you know, that was just one issue. Timothy also had to navigate people who would not listen to him because of his youthful age. And this is common for the young. How should a young person deal with such? Well, the answer is simple, but it's, a, it's simple, but not necessarily easy. Live the life God has called you to live according to the scriptures. Notice Paul's advice in 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Paul says, let no one despise your youth but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Now, Paul says to be an example. To who? Well, who, who are we to be examples to? More to the point, where does being an example start? Well, read it carefully what it says. It says, be an example to the believers in the world in conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. For, for, for this, is, this is for young people first, but this is also for everyone. But Paul is addressing the young people here. Uh, you are not called to live one way at home, and another way at church, and another way while engaging people in the world, whether it's in school, whether it's at work, whether it's on the athletic field. We're supposed to be the same everywhere we go. When Paul met Timothy and he heard uh, the praise that, from the people about this remarkable young person, he quickly realized that Timothy was cut above those around him. He was living in such a way that we are all called to live. He was actually doing it and achieving it at a young age in a pagan culture. 
It is doable. Now, how did Timothy come to faith? Who were his role models? Well, we find out in the second letter that Paul sent him. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Parents and grandparents, we find our marching orders here. The example that you set in your family is critical when it comes to whether your children and grandchildren will come to the faith. The things that you value will rub off on your children and your grandchildren. The choices you make, the things you approve or disapprove, they matter. You don't even have to talk about it. That old expression applies. More is caught than taught. Children are sponges. They take it all in. Even when you don't think they are. If you value reading your Bible and you do it in front of your children, your children will view it as something that's important. If you value going to church, your children will recognize it as valuable. Maybe not today. Maybe not for years. But when you do what is good and right, it gets implanted in the folds of their brain for future use. What you do, what you don't do matters. What you say, how you say it, what you don't say, they all matter. A number of studies, including one by the Global Ministry center of the Church of the Nazarene revealed that nearly 85% of people who later identify as born again Christians came to Christ by the age of 14. 85%. And an additional 10% cut came to come to Christ before the age of 30. That means that after the age of 30, only 5% of people who identify as born again are going to come to the faith. We have to catch them early. Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 9, uh, 14, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In a culture that grows more wicked by the day, our children need role models in the home who don't flinch. That is, they are careful to live out the truth in front of their young ones. We hinder them, as Jesus used the word, we hinder them when we are not those role models. We hinder them when we allow them to partake in things that are dangerous for their souls. Sometimes permissive parenting can be so dangerous to the souls of their children. And my challenge to parents and grandparents, and I'm both, is to consider your actions, your choices, your default settings of how you approach your day, the things you watch on TV, the way you talk, the way you treat your spouse, and so on. You are being watched. More is caught than is taught. It appears that Timothy had two important role models in his life, as we just saw, his mother and his grandmother. And they, were, uh, they, and they imparted the faith to him that shaped his whole life. Those two people were huge to his spiritual condition. Now there's one more thing to consider here when it comes to the, to the home that Timothy grew up in. Look again at, at Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Then he, again Paul, came to Derby and Leicester, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. Now, Timothy's dad was not born a Jew, like his mom and, and, uh, and his grandmother. He, no, he was a Greek. Now, that, did, that word does not necessarily mean that he was from Greece. The, the word actually had a wider connotation that he was a Gentile, that he was a non-Jew, and that he probably was not a believer in Jesus Christ. 
The point here is that not all was perfect in the home where young Tim grew up. His dad likely did not share the same faith as Timothy's mom. Does this sound familiar to some of you? I bet it does. In, in the most ideal situations in the home, both the mom and the dad would be Christians. Both would be striving to please Jesus and to be active in, in some way to grow their own faith and to help others to grow, both those in the family and, and being a blessing to those outside the family through some sort of ministry. But such homes are less common than we would hope. Yet in Timothy's case, even with the dad who is likely not a follower of Christ, the example of his mom and his grandmother carried the day. My point is, just because your spouse is not following Jesus, your faith, your prayers, your example can move mountains. If Timothy could come to Christ and be a shining example of the grace of God that, 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 could, and that could impact many others, your sons, your daughters can also enter into the household of faith and be productive in God's kingdom on earth. It can all begin as a product of your faith, your example. So be encouraged. Do what you know is best. Now read on in that situation. Uh, let's see if I have it on the screen up there. Pick it up in verse 2. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with. Now, can you see this with Paul? This eminent apostle, the greatest theologian the church has ever known, the most prolific writer of the Bible, the one who traveled more than any of the other apostles, he wanted Timothy to accompany him and Silas on their missionary trip. Now, understand this in its wider context. Paul had already been down this road once in taking on a younger person to, to join him in ministry. He had watched in disgust when earlier on his first missionary journey, uh, a, a young man named John Mark flamed out and left that ministry. Mark found out that it was, it was too hard for him and he went back home. He quit. In that first missionary journey, Paul was accompanied by Barnabas. And when they were about to leave for their second journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark again. And Paul was not for it. He would not have it. Watch this. In, in uh, Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 36. And then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul and Barnabas could not agree on what to do with Mark. Who, by the way, became not only a fine minister, but also he became a friend to Paul in the future and a writer of the gospel that bears his name, the gospel of Mark. But at that time, Paul had no use for him, viewing him as a quitter and too weak for this, uh, for this difficult ministry that he and Silas were in. And yet this same Paul saw something in 15-year-old Timothy that led them to believe that he had the metal to stand up to the rigors and the difficulties of ministry. Sometimes 
we don't give our children the credit that they deserve. Sometimes we leave the training wheels on a little too long. They can grow mature in the Word of God and in the ministry of God faster than we think. They need guidance, of course, and they need godly examples to follow. But your children, your grandchildren, have within them the capacity to become amazing ministers if someone will believe in them and walk alongside them. Now, before we close today, let's just look at the opening verses of the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Look at verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want you to notice how Paul addresses Timothy. He calls him a true son in the faith. What does that mean? When you win someone to Christ, you become their, their spiritual parent. You are their teacher, You are, and, and they are a disciple. A disciple, not really of you, but of Christ. Yet you are responsible before God to some point to teach them and to model for them though a way that the follower of Christ should live. Paul apparently did not win Timothy to the faith, but he probably won both Timothy's grandmother and mother to Christ. And he became a model to Timothy when he returned on his second missionary journey. He modeled how to live. As a father should model things to his children. As a mother should model things to her children. So Timothy became a true son to Paul in the faith. And this letter was written with a lot of fatherly advice. But it was also written as one veteran minister to a younger one helping him to navigate the many trials and pitfalls that can happen in pastoral ministry. When I was a young minister in my first church, I really didn't have a mentor, an older uh, pastor to show me the ropes, so to speak, as they say. And, and it, it made things far more difficult in some ways. There were times when just having a mentor may have saved me a lot of heartache. If I had someone to bounce an idea off of, or to help me through some knotty issues, or just to tell me I was on shaky ground and knock it off. Instead, I, I, I kind of went to the college of hard knocks when it comes to those kinds of things. And I learned by making mistakes, which isn't always the worst way to learn, but mistakes that were not only painful to me, but sometimes to others inside the church as well. When I think back to some of the advice that I gave, or even uh, when I spoke truth in important situations, I could have said things in a much different way, with, less, with a less injurious way, shall I say, that would have served the same purpose. But I ended up hurting people in, in, in some cases. I learned. And when I, when I read through my sermons from the 1980s and the 1990s, I still have all of them. Uh, when I read through them, I can't believe how I sometimes put things, how sometimes I said things in a way that I would never say them today. So if you think that I'm sharp today, you have no idea. Mentors are important for ministry. I wish I had a mentor. And, and really, mentors are important in most places in life. Today, I, I am a mentor to others. And even at my current age, I still have one or two mentors who help me. People that I can ask questions and receive feedback. People who will tell me things that maybe I don't want to hear, but that I need to hear. And, and they will give it to me straight. Paul became that mentor for Timothy. And for the next 15 to 20 years, Paul was, was there for his young protege. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. And we'll close with this. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus 
that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now Timothy was in Ephesus, it tells us here, doing what? Well, church history tells us that for many years he was the pastor to that church. And it was a difficult ministry. Before, before this, before he became a pastor, he also ministered as a troubleshooter for Paul, going from place to place around much of Asia Minor and Greece, and even to other parts of modern-day Europe as a minister. But as an old man, around the age of 80, in A.D. 97, Timothy was martyred in Ephesus for trying to stop a procession of worshipers to a false god. But by that time, he had impacted a whole generation of people, leading so many to Christ. In this letter, Paul encourages Timothy on how to run the church and how it should be set up, including leadership and holding worship services. And we need to, to heed some of these instructions. Paul imparts uh, understanding on how to structure a new assembly as an independent church. I think and I hope that this series of messages will be useful for us as a congregation as we strive to serve Christ in a culture that has walked away. Next week, we'll start getting into the back.